We're going to wait a few more minutes while people enter the webinar. Okay, I think uh, we'll get started. Um, welcome to the pre-application webinar for the Tobacco Centers of Regulatory Science. Next slide. We're just gonna go through a few uh, housekeeping issues before the webinar uh, gets started. So uh, first, uh, if you're having technical difficulties, please use the chat option at the bottom of your screen. Um, there's a, uh, it says technical support, so you can email or chat there for uh, technical assistance. Next slide. You can also view live closed captions by clicking the closed caption icon found at the bottom of the screen. Next slide. And then um, for the Q&A session that will follow the presentations, um, please use the chat trisp send questions here um, and we will consider um, all of the questions that come in during the webinar. Next slide. Uh, a recording of today's web webinar as well as the presenter slides are gonna be posted to the Tobacco Regulatory Science Program uh, website. It'll probably take about two weeks, but for your colleagues who might not be able to join today, uh, the webinar will be available. Next slide. So welcome, uh, I'm Helen Meissner, Director of the Tobacco Regulatory Science Program. Next slide. For those of you who are not familiar with the Tobacco Regulatory Science Program at NIH or TRISP as, as we call it, uh, we really serve as the hub between the FDA Center for Tobacco Products and the NIH Partnership in Tobacco Regulatory Science. Um, our office has responsibility for the trans-NIH activities with CTP, uh, including the issuance of funding opportunities such as the T-Cores, uh, grant team meetings and webinars, like the one you're participating in today. All TRISP research uh, must be responsive to CTP regulatory authorities, but I do always like to mention and remind folks that TRISP is an addition to uh, NIH tobacco research and certainly doesn't replace or diminish the existing tobacco research support that um, NIH provides. Next slide, please. Next slide. I seem to have uh, difficulty advancing the slide. Okay, there we go. Uh, Tobacco Regulatory Science Program has a website on the Office of Disease Prevention 
page prevention.nih.gov slash tobacco. And here you will find all current information about the program, including funding opportunities, um, links to uh, funded research and many other resources. So you may want to check back here. Also, we have uh, frequently asked questions posted on the website. Next slide, please. Just to mention, I'm guessing most of you are aware, but there are a couple of can, uh, companion funding opportunities that um, have come out uh, along with the T-Cores. Uh, we have an RFA for a coordination center, CASEL. There's an RFA for uh, rapid surveillance of tobacco, CREST. And uh, just uh, also a notice, just clarifying the eligibility for TCORs investigators. And just to note, I, I think there may have been some confusion about this. A TCORs PI cannot serve as the PI on um, the awarded CREST grant. Um, a TCORs PI or other key, uh, key personnel from TCORs cannot serve as members of a CASEL awardee team. Next slide, please. So the agenda for today uh, will begin with a presentation from Dana Van Bemmel uh, from the uh, FDA Center for Tobacco Products, followed by uh, Mary uh, Garcia Kazarian on uh, the RFA content and, and a slight switch in the agenda from what was posted, uh, we'll then hear from Amy Buckheimer at NIDA you know, about grants management, and then uh, from Lauren Fortas uh, from the Center for Scientific Review, and um, at which time we will then open it up for Q&A. So next slide. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dana. Great, thank you, Helen, you can hear me okay? Yes. All right. Great. Wonderful. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today to talk with you all a little bit about um, FDA's Center for Tobacco Products, a little bit on the regulatory activities that we perform here at CTP, and then how the research um, program, specifically research that may be generated from this funding opportunity announcement, may um, inform our regulatory activities. Next slide, please. So as Helen mentioned, this um, webinar is specific to the Tobacco Centers of Regulatory Science. The main goal of this program is to fund multidisciplinary research that will inform CTP's regulatory authorities. So the manufacture, distribution, and marketing of tobacco products. Next slide, please. Within the specific funding opportunity announcement, we have laid out um, eight scientific domains. I would encourage you to go specifically to the published um, RFA to look more closely at these scientific domains for specific examples, but these are the eight areas of research that we've highlighted and we'll touch on as we work our way through the, um, through the webinar today. For the purposes of this, next slide please. For the purposes of this, um, this webinar and for this funding opportunity announcement, we have defined the term characteristic as um, one in which encompasses materials, ingredients, um, design, composition, heat source, and other features of the tobacco product. So please keep that in mind as we walk through this webinar and as you review the information in the funding opportunity announcement. So I think that sets the stage for, for why we're here today. I'm gonna to take the next few slides to just talk a little bit about FDA's Center for Tobacco Products specifically. And I know for some of you, this information um, may be something that you're familiar with or heard before, but it felt, um, it felt like we should all be, be sure that we revisit this so that we're starting from the same place and our understanding about the goals of the Center for Tobacco Products um, and our overall mission, along with our strategic priority areas. So to start, FDA's Center for Tobacco Products has the overall goal to reduce harm from tobacco products across the entire population. And this includes reducing the number of people who start using tobacco products, encouraging people who are currently using tobacco products to stop, and reducing the adverse health impact for those individuals who are continuing to use tobacco products. 
And we think about this in terms of the population as a whole, but within this particular funding opportunity announcement and across um, FDA CTP as a whole, we encourage, encourage research, oh, I'm sorry, could we advance the slide? I'm gonna forget that the whole time, sorry folks. Um, so uh, we think about the population as a whole as we work through um, the research uh, that, that we fund. So specific to this funding opportunity announcement and to other areas of research, we encourage studies where appropriate to include vulnerable populations. And this is the list included in this current funding opportunity announcement. Um, and again, as appropriate, we encourage you to think about how, how you might address research questions specific to these populations. Next slide, please. So again, this is familiar to some of you, but for, for everyone, um, <clears throat> just a reminder that uh, the Center for Tobacco Products is a relatively new center at FDA. It was established um, in 2009 with the signing of the Tobacco Control Act. And at that time, it gave FDA the authority to regulate cigarettes, cigarette tobacco, roll your own, and smokeless tobacco. Then in 2016, FDA extended that through what we call the deeming rule um, to include all products that meet the statutory definition of a tobacco product. So a rule was finalized um, that most uh, probably most obviously brought in products, um, including electronic nicotine delivery systems or ENDS, so e-cigarettes, the vape pens, et cetera, brought those products under our regulatory authorities. In addition, um, it brought um, products such as cigars, pipe tobacco, um, water pipe and hookah products, um, and then uh, any future tobacco products, all under our regulatory authorities. Next slide, please. Just last week, um, we expanded the definition of a tobacco product through um, the president, president signing a spending bill. Um, this bill includes language um, that gives the Food and Drug Administration um, soon the ability to regulate tobacco products containing nicotine from any source, which includes um, synthetic nicotine, which I think many folks um, acknowledge is, is something of, of high interest in the, in the field today. So it took the definition of a tobacco product um, and expanded that to include uh, nicotine from any source. Um, this becomes effective in 30 days. Um, and so there is some additional information on our website on this, but again, this is very new. It's something we're just getting a handle on, but um, we've expanded that language through this, the signing of this bill. Next slide, please. So we've talked a little bit about our regulatory authorities. Um, I wanted to just take a minute to note areas that are often um, studied within tobacco control and tobacco science that are not within CTP's regulatory authorities and therefore are not responsive or part of our regulatory, um, part of the research that we can fund um, to support our regulatory activities. And some of those um, areas include setting tax rates for tobacco products, um, setting clean indoor air policies, providing cessation services. Again, these are all areas that, that we acknowledge are important in tobacco control and tobacco science, but they are not um, within our regulatory authorities here at the Center for Tobacco Products and are outside of the areas of research that we're able to fund. Um, a term that you'll hear um, associated with this is responsiveness. Um, we'll talk a little bit later at the end of this um, presentation about responsiveness specific to this funding opportunity announcement. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time, next slide please, uh, talking about some of the key strategic priority areas here at CTP. And as we walk through them, I'm gonna to try to pull some examples from the funding opportunity announcement of research um, areas and topics that help support these regulatory activities. So I've listed five here on this slide. You can learn more about them at our website linked here on the slide. Um, I'm gonna take the time um, today because we have limited time just to step through four of these areas um, very, very quickly. And I acknowledge um, in advance that there's a lot of information on the slides. I know we're moving quickly, um, but hopefully you'll have these here for your reference and you can revisit um, and then come, come with questions um, at a later time. Next slide, please. So to start, I'd like to spend a little time talking about product standards. Next slide, please. Um, our center director has often noted that this is one of the most powerful tools the Tobacco Control Act affords um, FDA. To set a product standard is really um, the ability to set a rule that sets requirements for how a tobacco product might be manufactured, distributed, sold, or um, offered for distribution or sale here in the United States. 
Um, FDA is on track currently to um, propose to have two product standards out within the next month, um, proposed product standards. One that prohibits menthol as a characterizing flavor in cigarettes, and the second that would prohibit characterizing flavors except tobacco in cigars. There's more information on our website about these, but I note these as two um, proposed product standards, again, that will be coming out, coming out soon, and just examples of the types of activities that, that can be done under this regulatory activity. Next slide, please. So when we think about um, developing a product standard, FDA must consider if the product standard is appropriate for the protection of public health. And you'll hear, hear that phrase used um, frequently. Um, I'm gonna spend some time to talk about it here under product standards, but please note that as we walk through other regulatory activities for Center for Tobacco Products, it really is um, underlying all of these, these activities. So when we think about appropriate for the protection of public health, it's slightly different than some of the other center activities here at the FDA. It means that we really need to assess the risks and benefits to the population as a whole. And that includes understanding the impact to both users and non-users of the tobacco product. Um, here on the slide, it notes under review, but that also includes um, product standards and other activities. We have to consider whether people who are currently using any tobacco products would stop using tobacco products as a result of this regulatory action, and whether non-users would start. So again, understanding the population as a whole. Next slide, please. Some examples of research that might inform product standard activity include studies um, that are developed to estimate the range of potential impacts on behavior or health that a potential regulatory action or product standard might, um, might have. So that it might include survey um, opportunities or research and behavioral economics experiments. Um, could include evaluations of state, local, or national policies. Um, again, understanding how, how that regulation, or in this case, product standard might impact, um, impact public health. It could also include um, the evaluation of the differential impact or some unintended consequences of a product standard or a specific um, action that CTP might take. In this case, it could be um, understanding how a product standard might um, affect vulnerable populations um, as those, such as those noted on the slide earlier, might, um, might be impacted differently than the population as a whole. Next slide, please. So in addition to be having the ability to set product standards, a large part of what CTP and the Office of Science where, where I am housed, um, we, we um, undergo product review. So we perform product review. Next slide, please. And there are a number of different pathways in which products can come into the Center for Tobacco Products for, for review. They're listed here at the top of the slide. Some of um, those pathways I think that folks probably are a little more familiar with include um, new product review or, or what is often termed PMTA or pre-market tobacco application review. Some of the questions we ask ourselves um, when we're looking at pre-market review, right, are related to this appropriateness for the protection of public health um, that we just discussed. So is this um, new product appropriate for the protection of public health? Uh, other pathways that uh, products can come into Center for Tobacco Products for review include substantial equivalence. Um, this is really um, having, having the review or taking a look at the, the product application to understand whether the differences between this new product and a product, predicate product raise any different questions around um, public health as a whole. And then finally, modified risk tobacco products or MRTP um, is, is the pathway often referred to um, in, in good government acronym form. Um, some questions around review of a modified risk product application might include um, assessing whether the product as it's actually intended to be used by the consumer significantly reduces the harm and risk of tobacco related disease to an individual user and how it impacts um, again, and may benefit health of the population as a whole. Applicants must provide adequate evidence to the FDA to, to make our findings or to make our decisions. So we've talked through some, some questions that we might ask um, as we're reviewing these applications, but it really is upon the applicant to provide the evidence. FDA, the, though, will use all available um, scientific evidence to evaluate what's presented to us in these applications, and that includes um, the tobacco regulatory science um, field as a whole, but really any research that informs um, a regulatory activity uh, can be considered tobacco regulatory science. Next slide, please. 
So as we're looking through, um, as we make our decisions around um, whether it be a pre-market decision or a modified risk um, marketing authorization, there are conditions described in these respective orders. So if a product should receive a marketing, um, a marketing, a market granting order, an MGO, there will be information listed on our website um, that is included in both the summary and the order letter itself. And within that order letter will be information such as um, regulations or um, <clears throat> requirements, I should say, for post-market record keeping, for example, um, post-market reporting activities that will be required, and any specific marketing restrictions related to advertising sale um, or perhaps marketing or uh, packaging or labeling. And I note that here because as you're thinking through what kinds of information um, might be helpful after a product might be authorized by the FDA, some valuable information can be found by visiting these marketing order letters and the summaries to both get a sense of the types of um, data and, and research and information that were reviewed in that market um, in that marketing decision, and then also what is included in the in the post market reporting. FDA does have the authority with, to withdraw a marketing order if it determines um, that the product that received the marketing order um, is no longer appropriate for the protection of public health. So again, um, some information to be considering as you are thinking about the projects and ways in which you might develop projects that inform um, FDA product review, tobacco product review. Next slide, please. Research that helps to inform product review, um, I touched on that just, just briefly here, but it really is information around the materials, the ingredients, the design and composition of the tobacco product. It can include um, information about marketing and advertising, and it can also include the impact of the tobacco product, um, including appeal to users, um, its addictiveness. Um, behavior and use behaviors related to those tobacco products, um, and then toxicity and exposure. So again, I've pulled some examples from, um, from the RFA to, to list here on this slide, but um, these are the types of research that help to inform our review activities here at CTP. Next slide, please. I'd like to take just a moment to talk a little bit about um, compliance enforcement activities here at CTP. Next slide, please. FDA takes a three-pronged approach to help ensure um, industry complies with the Tobacco Control Act. It includes developing and providing compliance training and education opportunities for industries, um, monitoring regulated industries compliance with the laws through activities such as inspections, investigation, and surveillance activities. And then when necessary, taking action. Um, and that action might include issuing a warning letter, um, issuing civil warning penalty complaints, or other actions um, against, against um, an industry um, or, or a group that maybe is not complying um, with the tobacco control laws, the regulatory um, tobacco control act or the regulatory laws. I will say though, generally speaking, um, most regulated entities work with us to ensure that they are within compliance with the federal tobacco laws. Next slide, please. Just a few um, examples of research that helps to inform our regulatory activities. Um, monitoring of tobacco industry marketing is helpful to our compliance enforcement activities. Um, Post-market surveillance of authorized tobacco products. Um, again, I noted some of that information that you can find on our website in both the order letter and the summary. And then evaluation of possible unintended consequences of a tobacco product um, action, or in this case, um, an authorization of a product and how that might um, differ among specific populations. Next slide, please. So uh, finally, I'd like to touch just a little on public education activities. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we have a robust, uh, field of research and activities around communication and education. We have an entire office, Office of um, Communication and Health Education here at Center for Tobacco Products. Starting in 2014, we, we launched a number of educational campaigns that were directed at discrete audiences, including the Real Cost Campaign, um, Fresh Empire, This Free Life, um, all listed here on the slide. I'm not going to read, read through everyone. Um, I don't have the time. I will say um, this spring, our, our newest uh, campaign entitled Next Legends, 
specific to American Indian and Alaska Native youth age 13 to 17 at risk for using e-cigarettes will launch. Um, I, that's later this spring. Um, in addition to education campaigns uh, listed, uh, listed here that, were, that are designed to be um, targeted for discrete audiences, we also have a voluntary education, um, retailer education campaign called This Is Our Watch, designed to educate retailers, clerks, and the public on how to comply with the federal tobacco laws. Next slide, please. When we think about research that can help inform health education, um, I've listed just a few examples here, but any types of projects that help to identify tobacco education messages, messaging components and communication channels that can um, help to prevent initiation and counter uptake of ends use um, is useful to, to this type of activity here at CTP. Research that looks to develop strategies to increase attention to or engagement with tobacco education messaging is important. Um, and then any kinds of research that might be um, designed that help identify messages to effectively communicate about risks associated with constituents such as nicotine use and potential, potential relative harms of tobacco products other than conventional cigarettes. Um, these are all examples of research that can help to inform um, our communication and education activities here at CTP. Next slide, please. So hopefully um, as we've walked through these slides, you have a sense um, that science is underlying all of the decisions and actions here at Center for Tobacco Products. Next slide. Um, it touches all of our regulatory activities um, as depicted here on this slide, but really in all of our decision-making, we are using all of the available evidence um, and, and available scientific date, um, data and evidence base to inform our regulatory actions and activities. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the webinar, there are some areas of research that are not responsive to this specific funding opportunity announcement. Um, they're listed here on this slide. I'm not going to take the time to read through all of these, but I just want to note that these um, are research areas that are technically responsive or could be funded by CTP through this funding opportunity announcement, but they're not included in this specific um, funding opportunity. So please take the time to take a look at these, and if you have any specific questions, um, you can reach out to your NIH program contacts, those that are listed either in this RFA or the funding opportunity announcement or um, your own uh, program officers. Next slide, please. Before I, I close, I'd like to just take a minute to talk a little bit about some common non-responsive areas um, that we encounter here at CTP in working with, um, with researchers. Um, there are a number of them, but these are three that really rise to the top. Um, the first of which is research around cannabis or marijuana. And for this example, I'm gonna expand it to really any vaping device that might deliver something other than nicotine. So we know that um, there are products being advertised right now that, that deliver melatonin, for example, or different vitamins. All of these are non-responsive um, areas of research if the primary outcome is how that specific um, device impacts health or impacts um, use of that particular product. So a study with the primary outcomes of um, marijuana use, for example, are not responsive to CTP because we don't regulate um, marijuana. However, if a research study was designed to evaluate the extent to which, let's say, e-cigarette users are using marijuana in their tobacco products, as a means to more accurately characterize or assess tobacco product use as a whole or a specific tobacco product use, then that research may be responsive to CTP regulatory authorities. Um, and so I'm gonna use uh, the, the phrase, it depends. I'm gonna use that at least three times as we walk through the bullets on this slide, but whether or not your research in cannabis um, or marijuana or, or say these other vaping devices is responsive to the RFA and to tobacco regulatory authorities really depends on the types of studies that are designed. And again, I'm gonna encourage you to speak with your NIH program folks um, to really understand whether or not the projects you're thinking about developing are responsive and can be funded under this RFA. The second area of research um, that often is, is discussed um, that, that is outside of our regulatory authorities includes um, FDA's, uh, includes tobacco cessation treatment. So specifically, FDA's Center for Tobacco Products um, regulatory authorities don't extend to regulatory, regulating therapeutic uses of tobacco products. 
Um, this authority actually lies with another center here at the FDA, and so it's technically outside of our regulatory authorities. If your study is designed to understand how a product can be used to treat, to treat um, and use, use the product in a therapeutic way. Um, however, if your study is designed in more of an observational way, so if it's an observational study to examine the natural history, let's say, of whether participants quit smoking cigarettes while using a different type of tobacco product, that type of research is responsive and helpful to the Center for Tobacco Products. So again, um, whether or not cessation work is responsive to the Center for Tobacco Products and the RFA depends, and I encourage you to talk with your, your program folks about that at NIH. And finally, I wanted to touch just a little bit on treatment and diagnosis, um, specifically around models for this. So FDA Center for Tobacco Products does not regulate products or support the development of clinical interventions intended for the treatment of disease. However, if there is a model of disease, say uh, a viral infection such as influenza or COVID-19, if, if that study is designed to model and understand long-term damage that might be associated with a tobacco product use in that specific model of infection, let's say, that information is helpful to the Center for Tobacco Products and may be responsive um, to the health effects research aims. Um, but again, it really depends because if this study is designed more to investigate the impact of tobacco use on infection or severity of disease, um, really something to, to inform primarily um, diagnosis or treatment of, of an infection, then that um, is not responsive to CTP regulatory authorities. So again, it depends. And I encourage you to um, reach out to your program folks at NIH if you have questions about whether or not any and anything is responsive, um, not just these three topics that I've shared here on the slide. Next slide, please. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, just a slide to, to remind everyone that the Center for Tobacco Products looks at a broad range of research that are covered by those research domains and really led by um, a strong, uh, strong scientific uh, force a, a workforce here at the Center for Tobacco Products. Next slide, please. And before I end, um, I just want to um, bring us back to thinking about your research proposals and how you might develop research that's informative to the Center for Tobacco Products. So we've given some examples, none of which are more important than another um, research example. I, I should have said that at the onset. If I didn't, I apologize. But all of these are just examples. I did not pull any one example any, under any um, of these strategic priority areas to say these research areas are more important than another. They're simply examples to help um, try to illustrate how we use research here in the Center for Tobacco Products. So please don't read too much into those examples. Um, I also want folks to consider what CTP says. I know that sometimes FDA can be a little bit of a black box. Um, it's not always clear. We can't always be as transparent as we want to be about the activities that we're working on. But look at the announcements that come from FDA. Um, look at our, our newsroom website, our CTP news um, updates. Think about information that's being shared by our commissioner. Um, any types of announcements related to notice of proposed rulemaking or um, uh, requests for information, those are all um, indicators and it can give you some insight into what the types of activities that CTP is working on. I've already talked a little bit about um, authorization, so I won't, I won't go too far into that except to define um, MDO as a marketing denial order and MGO as a, marketing grant, a market granting order. Um, and finally, I, I would invite you that as you're developing your, to think about how you, if you worked here at FDA, would use the information that you're generating. What specific rule or other regulatory decision are you hoping that the research that you're developing and generating might, um, might be, and how might it be used here at the Center for Tobacco Products? And remember that when we are making our decisions here at FDA, we're using a broad range, uh, the, the broad research, the, all of the evidence that's available to us here. What I'm trying to say is don't think that you need to design one center or one project that can answer every question related to any one specific rule or regulatory decision, but really think about how you can focus in your research projects on specific areas. And in that area, what would you like to see in front of you and how can you help design products, projects that can help inform those specific rules or regulatory decisions? Okay, and with that, I am going to end and, and hand it over to the next speaker. Thank you, Helen. 
Thank you, Dana. That was really informative. Um, our next speaker will be Mary Garcia Casarin uh, from TRISP, and she will address the content of the RFA. Mary? Yes, hello. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to be presenting about just some, some of the key elements for the T course. Uh, next one, please. All right. Uh, as 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 you may as you may know already, these are U fifty fours. What that means is um, there is going to be substantial uh, involvement from NIH and from FDA. And one of the main goals of the T course are uh, pointed out in this slide, which is establish the scientific um, foundation for regulatory and policy issues relevant to the work of the FDA Center for Tobacco Products. Another overall goal for this course is to build research capacity and scientific um, expertise. And another very important one is to, to, to try to build a, a basically a stable ongoing research uh, uh, enterprise that will be able to answer questions as, as needed as well. The ne next one, please. Uh, this slide right here, uh, it just basically give you the basic components for the T course, and I'm gonna try to describe each of these components in my next slides. Next one, please. Uh, the first one right here is, this is a very important one. Uh, we really encourage T course to have an overall integrative theme. Uh, it's very important for an application to have this. This is, this is gonna be based on the eight scientific domains that I that are really well described in your RFA. And what I really think about these integrated things is that this will become like the DNA for that center. They, uh, this, this, this theme should also concentrate on areas where there are significant gaps in knowledge, such as also uh, regarding tobacco products or um, other examples, as you can see. And as my uh, FDA colleague already mentioned, these are all based in the A scientific domains that you can find a, a more description of this of them in the in the FOA. The next one, please. Okay, a very important component also of this T course is the project, the research projects, and again, they they must be within the scientific domains, and here. Um, these are very important components for these projects. The overall T course more, must address no fewer than two of the eight scientific domains. A single project may uh, address one or more of these domains. And also it's very important to know that it's not necessarily the best to have projects that address all the scientific domains. I think it's very good to have that uh, integrated theme that PIs can focus on that theme and how to fill up some gaps that are important for FDA Center for, tab for Tobacco Products. Also, we highly recommend that you make very clear in your applications, what are the scientific domains that are being covered through these projects. Next one, please. So um, we, we require that at least there are three of these projects and they have to be integrative and also they have to reflect that integrative thing for the T course. They are uh, developed as basically uh, R01 projects, and many of you are very familiar with those projects. Also, each project and each specific aim should be responsive to the RFA. And by now, you already heard the term responsive um, many, many times, and also should be within the scope of FTA Center for, to for Tobacco Products. A very important thing to do that I think uh, gives, um, it's, it's very important to do for this project is how will this research inform uh, FDA? The next one, please. Okay, the next key component for the T course is this administrative core. This is a core that really promotes an environment of communication and collaboration among investigators within the the proposed course. Also, if you're able to interact with a coordination center that is called CASO and the rapid surveillance of tobacco products called CREST, and of course, also with the FDA and NIH staff. Uh, another thing is each T course will have an external advisory board 
that we'll meet at least once a year. And of course, there are way more, a, a lot more detail about this in the FOA. Next one, please. Okay. Another important key component of the T course is the career enhancement core. This is this core will uh, will basically concentrate on research experiences and related activities that will enhance the development of tobacco regulatory science expertise. And this is we uh, this will be among students, fellows, scholars, new and early stage investigators, and investigators that are new to tobacco regulatory science. One of the goals of the Career Enhancement Corps is that perhaps some of these uh, people participating in this call, they will eventually become independent tobacco regulatory science PIs. Uh, so within this core, we have what is called the pilot projects. Pilot projects are, will be those studies that will be actually done by the, by the people that, are, that I already mentioned, could be students, could be fellows, could be PIs. And each T course will basically design how to manage these pilot projects and also how to provide funds, how to budget for these pilot projects. And uh, but the most important thing here is they need to be deemed responsive and also they need to be approved by NIH and your uh, FDA federal partners. Next one, please. Also, um, we suggest that we, we uh, you, Applicants are actually allowed to, uh, to suggest other T cores. Of course, these are gonna be as needed and you have to justify it, uh, what kind of other T cores are needed for your center. Some, of, some examples will be, could be, for example, a data uh, analysis uh, core, biospecimens core, and others. Next one, please. So uh, here we have an overall, the expected features of the T cores. Again, we um, we expect that they will be working in collaboration with the coordination center called CASEL, as we mentioned before. They also will have uh, they will have a, all the T cores. We have a, a, a steering committee that will be governed by uh, by a PI from each of the T cores, by a CASEL PI, and from um, also will include people from NIH and FDA. Uh, another thing that we recommend here is that perhaps the T cores could identify common measures and protocols. An example of this can be found in the FOA, for example, the Phoenix Toolkit, and there are other examples in there. And, and another important feature of the uh, T cores is that they're open to addressing ongoing scientific issues um, that have to do, with, of course, relevant to FDA Center for Tobacco Products. Next one, please. Okay, here we come to the term of responsiveness, something that you have heard several times. So there is gonna be multiple aspects of the application that will determine whether your whole application is responsive or non-responsive to the FOA, and also that is within the scope or FDA Center for, tab for Tobacco Products. It's very important that you identify the overall theme for your T course, and I say, I kind of put it in terms of this is the DNA of your center. Also a program of research that addresses no fewer than two of the eight scientific domains that are listed in the RFA. And also all the specific aims across all the research projects must fall, um, will, has to be responsive to the RFA, but also they have to be within scope of FDA Center for Tab Tobacco Products. Also no aims in the application uh, will need to, no, no aims are allowed that will cover non-responsive topics that are very well described in the RFA. Next one, please. Um, so we highly recommend that you discuss your potential project with one of the program officials that is listed in the contact section of the RFA that also we highly recommend that you submit a letter of intent. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit more information about that. And that letter of intent will really help us to really uh, identify any potential topics that are non-responsive for the RFA. And also it will help us to see what kind of theme are you proposing for your T course. Next one, please. So this letter of intent, uh, it is not required, but we highly recommend it, especially for these very large uh, grants. 
um, we recommend for you to submit it no later than May 15. And this will include, as you can see here, a descriptive title of your projects, the name of people participating, uh, also the specific aims for your research projects, the overall theme, and what scientific domains you're, uh, what, what are you proposing, uh, what scientific domains are covered in your application. Next one, please. And this is perhaps going to be covered later on, but I, uh, we get this question often. Foreign institutions cannot apply for these grants, but they could have some foreign uh, components. So it's very important to remember that. Next one. And lastly, we're going to be posted FAQs specifically for this RFA, perhaps in the next few days. So we highly recommend for you to check our website and then different ways to access our website. As you can see here, you can do just a very uh, quick Google search. And we have a, a QR um, code right here if you want to scan it and it will take you directly to that. It will also uh, take you to our research that has been already funded, the current course, so you can see what kind of research it's, it's been funded already. Also, we have in our website, we have a FAQ document that has a very broad examples of responsiveness. It doesn't necessarily apply to this particular RFA, but it gives you a lot of examples of research that, that is deemed responsive. So you can see uh, some clear examples there. And uh, lastly, the next one, please. We really recommend for you to be in touch as was uh, previously said, with the program officials in the RFA, the early you do this, um, the better it is for us. So we can guide, guide you, we can help you, we can answer any questions that you may have. And with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Um, we are now going to move along to Amy Buckheimer from NIDA to discuss some of the administrative and budgetary requirements related to the RFA. Amy? Hi, good afternoon. I'm glad to be here to fill you in on some of the administrative um, portions of the, uh, the webinar. Um, next slide, please. Um, the general award information includes um, FDA being willing to support up to eight applications um, for a total of $32 million for FY23. Applicants may request up to 4 million in total costs annually. Um, future year total costs will depend upon availability of funds as is the case with all grants and cooperative agreements. Um, applicants can request a project period of up to five years. Um, and as Mary just mentioned, um, non-domestic entities are not to apply, but you can have a component to a domestic parent. Next slide, please. Um, the following dates are important to note. Um, as Mary also mentioned, um, it's important to emphasize the letter of intent if you're submitting one will be due May 15th, 2022. Um, application due date would be July 14th. And the earliest possible start date um, for consideration would be September of 2023. Um, each of these cooperative agreements would include a special term requiring a separate uh, six month progress report at the um, six month portion of every budget year. Next slide, please. Um, the funding mechanism that would be utilized would be a U54 cooperative agreement mechanism. And what that means is these don't allow for automatic carry author carryover authority. Rather, you would submit a prior approval request in order to utilize unobligated funds. And the approval process will be based on bona fide needs. Um, the non-SNAP designation simply means that, again, they're not automatically uh, given carryover authority, and annually um, IRB and IACRC would need, need to be submitted in FFRs. Thank you, Amy. Um, and uh, finally, we are going to hear about grants review from Lauren Fortis. Lauren? Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Lauren Fordyce. I'm a scientific review officer in the Center for Scientific Review. 
Uh, we are the center that review about 75% of the applications that come through the NIH. And you can go to the next slide. So just um, the key dates for this application review, as uh, has been already mentioned, the application due date is July 14th. Um, they will be reviewed in January 2023, and then they will go to the institute or center where they're assigned for second stage review and advisory council review in May 2023. Uh, it's important to note that according to this RFA, no late applications will be accepted. Next slide. So that means your application must be completed at the time of submission. We cannot make any changes to the applications after they've been submitted. Uh, there are a few items that can be submitted according to the NIH post submission material policy and I listed the notice here, uh, but you would receive information about how to follow through on this from the scientific review officer assigned to run the study section meeting. Um, and there would be information about that, but you see, you can check the notice. Next slide, please. Uh, so the NIH, the uh, NIH mission uh, for CSR is that all applications should receive a fair, independent expert and timely review free from inappropriate influence, which is why we highlight uh, conflicts of interest. So we make an effort to avoid all real or perceived, even the appearance of any conflicts of interest. And we have two kinds of conflicts of interest. We have out of meeting conflicts and out of room conflicts. So out of meeting conflicts means that a, any person who is listed as involved personnel on the application or persons who are involved in the tobacco industry would not be allowed to review the, meet, review the application. So they could not even be included in the meeting. Um, next slide, please. So out of room conflicts means that anyone who collaborates or knows people that are listed on an application would not be allowed to review the specific application or score it. Um, these are important to keep in mind because this can sometimes include, especially with these really, really large projects, these can include even people who write letters of support or have very minor roles. If there is a person who is in, who knows that person, they will not be allowed to review the application. So uh, just you know, keep that in mind when thinking about uh, the expertise on these panels. It, it, it gets complicated when you're trying to get all the people who don't already have conflicts. Next slide. So this is very tiny, I realize, but I just wanted to point out that most of what I'm going to go through in the next couple of slides. This is all written in the funding opportunity announcement. So this information is taken directly from section five. You can see there, it sort of goes explicitly through each of the review criteria that we use, our five main review criteria. And it has additional questions that the reviewers will have to address when scoring any of these applications. Next slide. So here I've highlighted you know, for instance, under significance, there's additional questions such as how will successful completion of the aims affect the concepts, methods, and technologies related to the manufacturer, distribution, and marketing of tobacco products. So again, these questions are in addition to the five main review criteria that reviewers are already assessing and evaluating. Uh, so you just want to be sure you take a look at section five when you're creating your um, application. Next slide. Additionally, for this um, RFA, they do allow clinical trials. So if your application uh, is a clinical trial, please be aware that they will also be, it'll also be evaluated for um, the criteria for clinical trials, such as experience in managing a clinical trial, you know, the Data safe, data management, and statistical analysis, the environment, all of the typical things that we review for clinical trials. Next slide. Uh, additionally, there are additional review criteria specific to the T core. Um, these are not given individual scores, but will be considered and weighted in the overall impact score of the application. So you can see, again, if you uh, look at section five, these, this is explicitly written in the FOA. Next slide, please. So here's uh, the specific thing spelled out, the center coordination and synergy. 
research potential to inform regulatory decision making and career enhancement plan, which I think were touched upon in um, early presentations. Next slide. Uh, and again, just the standard additional review criteria, such as protection for human subjects, inclusion of women, minorities, individuals across the lifespan, um, vertebrate animals, biohazards, resource sharing plan. So these, again, the standard things that would be considered uh, when reviewing an application. Next slide. And that's all. So again, I just wanted to confirm that uh, in section five, you will find all of the information you need to know about how the application will be reviewed. Thank Next you, slide. Lauren. Uh, we now will move to the Q&A portion of the webinar. And again, please send your questions in the chat to Tris send questions here. So uh, I will get started reading the questions. The first one here is, uh, will the slides be made available? Yes, slides and a recording of uh, this webinar will be available on the TRISP website along with uh, frequently asked questions, which we'll be continuously updating as more questions come in. Um, hopefully these will all be posted a couple of days after the webinar. So Mary, I think the next question is for you. Is there a limit on pilot funding that can be distributed? Uh, no, there is there is no limit. So it is up to each center to determine what is the, the uh, right amount of funding that they should be using for their pilot projects. Next question is, are surveillance activities allowed under this RFA or should all surveillance activities go in the new surveillance center crest? So certainly TCORS can include surveillance research as appropriate to the center aims. Um, we envision that TCORS with surveillance activities uh, will be collab collaborating with CREST to add uh, to the overall surveillance uh, of tobacco products. Um, the TCORs uh, may in fact serve as sentinel sites for CREST, which are described in that RFA, so you may wanna to refer to it. Um, as both TCORs and CREST are cooperative agreements, there'll be opportunities to come coordinate among funded centers with similar or overlapping projects. So this could allow for um, development of some synergies like shared measures or even perhaps having uh, more coverage of um, different populations. So this is really a, a good question just to highlight the fact that it's important to submit your specific aims with your letter of intent because this will allow NIH and FDA to give you feedback about the scope and um, coordination. So um, be sure to do that. So the next question is how many projects do you recommend? Uh, what is the minimum number of projects. Mary, do you want to go ahead yes. and answer that? So um, there is a minimum of three out of one type of projects that are required for the applications. Uh, of course, PIs can suggest more than three projects, but remember that all, pro all projects should uh, need to be part of the integrative theme. Also, investigators should think about feasibility and spreading themselves too thin when they propose so many projects and staying within the $4 million total cost budget cap. Great. Next question. Can R1 type projects focus on secondary data analyses or is only new data collection expected? So certainly they, uh, the projects can focus on secondary data analyses or, or they can collect new data, but um, keep in mind that the projects should address the scientific domains listed in the overall um, RFA and um, also, of course, address your integrative theme. Um, I, sh I should point out here, though, that if you're just interested in doing secondary data analyses, we do have an active R21 funding opportunity announcement specifically for that purpose. So if that's the type of research you want to do, you might want to check that one out. 
So the next question is, are multiple project leads allowed on individual projects within a T course? Mary? Yes, yeah, the answer is, is yes. Okay, I think the next question is for Dana. A non-responsive research topic was listed as impacts of marketing restrictions on adults except for studies on newly authorized products. What products are allowed under this criteria? Does this mean any product deemed in the de deeming rule or does this refer to something else? Thanks, Helen. So that exception um, under the non-responsive responsive research topics is specific to newly authorized products. So a newly authorized product would be something like Verve or Views or, or the very low nicotine cigarettes that came out under PMTA um, recently. For this specific impacts on marketing restrictions on adults, it's, so that exclusion is specific to newly authorized products. Does that help clarify? Yeah, I think so. For the Career Development Corps, and I should just say, if you feel that um, our answers haven't aren't answer, uh, appropriately or completely answering your question, feel free to uh, send us an email or um, even better, contact uh, one of the people listed in the RFA and we'll be sure to, uh, to answer the question. So for the Career Development Corps, is the intent for the pilot projects to be granted in the Career Development Program or open widely to anyone who's interested? Mary? Yes, thank you. Uh, so either the strategy, it is, it is allowed. So for instance, a T Corps can design their pilot project program to support their new investigators or uh, PIs transitioning or any people doing research, transitioning into tobacco regulatory science or projects that include a collaboration. Mary, I think the next one is for you as well. Can you explain more about how graduate students and postdocs are expected to be integrated into the program? Is the emphasis more on pilot projects and early stage faculty, or is it more balanced? What is meant by strong institutional support can you provide some examples of what's expected? Yeah, so thank you for that question. This is a, a good question. So we don't, um, no, we don't expect them to only be included in pilot projects. This could be an opportunity to allow fellows or new, new or early stage investigators to get experience leading a project. Uh, rather, we see the career enhancements, enhancement activities to be more integrated within and across research projects and cores. And I think a related question is whether pilot projects to NI, uh, need to be submitted to NIH for review before they can be funded. If so, what's the expected turnaround for time for those decisions? Uh, yes, again, this is a good question as well. So yes, pilot projects. So remember, T course will actually, each T course will design their pilot project program in terms of who gets the pilots, how they're gonna get, uh, approve other T cores. Independently of that process, these T cores need to be routed. And you know that there is going to be some very specific information about that. Uh, they need to be routed through us so that NIH and FDA federal partners, we uh, look at them to make sure they are responsive. Okay, so yes, they need to be reviewed prior to T cores spending money on these pilots. Uh, and then another pilot project question, can uh, pilot projects or pilot funds only be used for career enhancement, that is for new trainees, new faculty, et cetera, is that correct? Yes, so uh, the, the RFA indicates that pilot project funds are to be spent within the career en en enhancement core. Um, but this is not necessarily just for new trainees or new PI. I mean, uh, one, one thing that we have seen is yes, they are mainly uh, sometimes used for actually bringing people into, into the new field of tobacco regulatory science. And we encourage uh, T cores to actually include you know, new trainees and new faculty, but they can be used to support broad projects. And sometimes this include 
uh, kind of senior investigators as well. Okay, uh, the next question, is there an advantage of having young faculty without previous R01 as, as one of the PIs, like a P01 treats them? So I think by PI, you might be referring to project lead here because certainly someone, a junior faculty without a previous R01 would not likely get a good, review as qualified to be leading, the, being an overall PI of a U54. Um, if you mean project leads, certainly, um, you know, at, with uh, depending on the, the person's background and experience, uh, I wouldn't say a project lead has to have had a previous R1. In fact, I think I can think of some examples for previous T cores where that was the case. But that said, um, you know, the reviewers are going to be looking to see, you know, that the person is is qualified to to lead the research. So asking if it's an advantage, I wouldn't necessarily say so. It is not spelled out in the RFA and I wouldn't expect reviewers to um, favor uh, young investigators, although um, it, it certainly would be encouraged. Okay, next question. If health effects is being investigated, what is the, the separating definition between short, acute versus long chronic effect? Does it matter to differentiate and what would be considered to meet the demand of the RFA? So Dana, I think this is probably a question for you. Sure, I, I can give that a shot. I, I guess the, the simple answer is that there isn't a real uh, specific definition of what acute versus chronic would look like. I think it really depends on the model that you're um, using and the question, the specific question and health effect that you're looking at. So I would just encourage folks to reach out to their NIH program staff to, to better develop that research question. Um, but, but the answer really is it depends, I think. Um, next question, Lauren, I think this is going to be for you. It's uh, for review. Can we be assured that people who consult with the tobacco industry that is receive payment from the industry, you know, maybe not be employed directly by an industry entity, uh, can uh, they be assured that uh, these folks will not be reviewers? Um, yes, given that uh, one of the lists of a conflicts of interest is that people from the tobacco industry, and um, I assume that would in include people who receive funding from the tobacco industry, um, would not be reviewers. Obviously, we will have to work with anyone who we reach out to be with reviewers to find out more information about where their funding is coming from. But, you know, we work very, very hard on our conflicts of interest, it's probably a huge portion of my job is managing conflicts of interest. So um, I imagine the review officer will work closely with reviewers to be sure that the most, um, that everyone should be in the reading that is in the meeting. Okay, um, I'll wait another minute or two. I'm not seeing any new questions coming in, but I'll give it just another minute. Uh, if not, we will be concluding the webinar. Um, and as mentioned, um, you're welcome and encouraged to contact uh, NIH staff for um, answers to your questions. Also, just for input on the ideas, what you're thinking about proposing, uh, that's what we're here for. So don't be shy about um, contacting us. Okay, is that, all right. Uh, Helen, can yeah. I just uh, rectify something? Yes. So I think in, in one of my slides, perhaps the email for Dr. Rachel Granamain, perhaps is incorrect. So please refer to the RFA for all the uh, program official contact information. Um, just to make sure you have the correct information. 
Okay, well, thank you for joining and uh, we look forward to seeing your applications. That concludes this webinar.